All right, welcome back. Episode 155 of Chaotically Intolerant. We're here with Caleb today. Um, we're going to be talking baseball all day. Um, just the past week of baseball stuff. Yeah, it's it's been a crazy week, um, but we will uh, jump into that. Just make sure to like, subscribe, comment, uh, the whole thing, and let's do it. So, first off, I want to start the show at the very top. There's a few things that we can start, but the Fanatics uniforms. It's another week of horrendous, horrible, shitty uniforms. I can't remember. Riley Green tore his pants halfway down his leg yesterday. It, this is insane. This is crazy that this is being allowed. Yeah, I when I played, we've we've seen some some pants like it'll it'll rip if you catch the dirt funny but i've never seen pants just rip a a clean three foot hole mm-hmm. on on a slide into home and it, it just kind of adds to all the shit we've been talking about everybody's been talking about since spring training since these uniforms have come in i mean and then we've got uniforms that that aren't even here yet like these are big league teams their pants are ripping. Their their uniforms aren't ready. It's like it's like little league. Like it's a bad showing from from fanatics and all the all the people making those uniforms. It, it reminds me of literally in little league when your coach tells you, "Hey, you know the the unis are going to be in soon. They're going to be in soon." And then they're late, and like it's that you know they give you like a date, and then they're late, and you come to practice on like a Tuesday night, and you're so disappointed. You're like, we don't get our shirts. We don't get our uniforms. And but that shouldn't be happening in the major leagues. That that should only be something that happens at not even the high school level, like rec ball level. That's this is ridiculous. And and just the qual what do we the colors don't match. The colors just don't match. Yeah, you don't see this stuff in high school ball or college ball, anything like that. It's it's this is we and we've never seen it in the bigs or even in the minors. Like this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. You don't see it in indie ball. Like when the the only time I can think of like uniform issues are when they aren't shipped from like, like, you know, a team goes on a road trip and the uniforms get lost somehow. That's the only time. And that's understandable. But Fanatics said, so I, I read up on this more Fanatics released a statement saying, hey, we gave them certain delivery dates and they chose dates in June or, or in May. I was like, why is that even an option? Like, why are you, why are you even giving them an option to deliver the jerseys in May? You had the schedule since like July of last year, August. That's when they released the next year's schedule. This is the most incompetent, like, organization I've ever seen, and they're still making billions and billions of dollars. Yeah, and and, and the stuff you you see like this, I, I'll I'll try to defend. At any point, I can't think of any way to defend this. They they've known about this for a while. They it's, it's just inexcusable. It's 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 a crazy thing that nobody's seen. Did they think the season was just going to be canceled? Was that the that was the that was the thought? It was like, oh well, maybe the season will get canceled this year, so we have a little bit of a pushback. Maybe they thought there was going to be a strike again. I mean, with Pavetta and Story hurt, I wouldn't mind it, but. That's that's for another topic. Yeah, let's. Well, we can jump into the Red Sox. So, um, that I guess that's. I, I do want to start off. The Red Sox do a great job with with the ceremonies. They honored the 2004 Red Sox uh, on Tuesday, um, and then obviously Tim Wakefield and Larry Lacino, who both passed. Um, fantastic! Like the the video just has you tearing up it, almost immediately. Like when they start the montage. It's like, oh my God, I'm I'm not gonna make it through this. And then they bring out his kids, Wakefield's kids, to throw out the first pitch. I was like, okay, I'm waterworks now. Like the dam is burst. This is that's the one thing. You if you can you can say anything about the Red Sox, but you can't say they do that bad. No, that 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 whole that whole tribute, the whole video was 
it's insane. And for someone like me and, and probably, probably like you, we don't really have a deep, deep memory of that 04 team, but they did a great job of making you feel like you were really there because you're a fan now. You, you're part of that fan base that experienced that. You get to experience that with them. You get to go on on this journey of remembering Tim Wakefield and getting emotionally connected to that first pitch and and just having all the the O four guys around them and then Kevin Millar and Trot Nixon saying, Hey, the his, Tim's kids have seventeen, eighteen uncles around here that'll protect them and be there for them. So it's the whole ceremony was just incredible. So I, I, it, I was fighting back some tears. I felt a little emotional and I'm not even, I, I wasn't old enough to get emotionally invested as much into Tim Wakefield, but it was, yeah, I still, I felt like I knew him forever. It was great showing. Well, we also caught them at the end of their careers. So I feel like that there's almost like a sort of like a, an emotional attachment because you saw the end, you saw like, you were told these stories of greatness and then we saw, you know, they weren't, obviously they're not as good towards the end of the career, but I watching big pot, like watching the whole team, like surround them while his kids carried the 2004 world series trophy. I was like, this is, I mean, it, it literally just looks like a village. They, they say it takes a village to raise kids. That's their village. That would be, I, I think anyone would be happy to have that village. Just David Ortiz. I mean, a big hug from David Ortiz feels like an, like a large embrace, basically. Yeah, and, and they said over the PA when when uh, Wakefield's daughter was throwing out the first pitch to some, they said she's throwing to somebody who's been basically family the last 15, 16 years in Jason Veritek. And speaking of that, we saw Veritek and Wakefield at the end of the year, our careers, or their careers, like we said. But we saw kind of their their chase for the last milestones. We, we, I, mean, I remember growing up watching Tim Wakefield fight for 200 wins. And well, while we may not have seen those two guys specifically in their prime, we saw the effect that happened after they left, like how, how mm-hmm. crucial those two were to the team in terms of leadership. And they retired in 11, I believe, and then 2012 they finished dead last. Yeah. So, yeah, we saw what happened. Was- yeah, and we, so those guys left. We lost that leadership, and and even now, seeing what kind of leadership they brought past their career, so it's mm-hmm. definitely tough. I don't know the the ceremony was was awesome, and I'm, I'm I'm glad that that was as long as it was. I think it was like ten fifteen minute ceremony that delayed the game, but it was very worth it. It was a great ceremony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were some people in the live stream of the ceremony, like, whining. They were like, let's get the game started. Why Why are we – somebody said, why are we honoring this team, which I think they thought they were honoring, the like, the Red Sox as, like, the current team. Everyone, Literally everyone attacked the people that said that. They're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, this is history here. You can't, you can't attack, like, the current organization for, you know, celebrating the greats, like, the history, so – um, real tear jerker, and then the Red Sox just completely, completely disappoint on on a day like I, I, I honestly am not shocked that they got killed yesterday. To be honest, because um, of the emotion, I think at the beginning, I'm I'm not either, but only because Corbin Burns was on the mound. That that dude's just so nasty. And Tyler and O'Neill got Bayo into one. I, honestly, Bayo, the stat line doesn't doesn't do him justice. I I mean, it shows he gave up. I think three or four runs, but only one was I earned. Say it, was three. it wasn't as bad, but no, he was he was cruising until the defense kind of let him down, which he should have made pitches to get out of that situation. But he, he also shouldn't be in that situation. You're giving away extra outs, and that's the best way to give up runs. Yeah the uh, the defense for for the Red Sox is really going to be an issue. I mean, we we already saw a story the immediate impact of losing Trevor Story for the season right away i mean you saw it in the angels series and then you see it now um even in like non-crucial situations like i think in the top of the eighth or top of the ninth um baltimore put up a couple extra runs insurance runs and it was on the backs of of a couple of red sox errors so that's a crucial loss i mean the red sox obviously pavetta isn't a big loss but you know they're they're 
they're falling apart very, very quickly. And I, I'd like, I see people say, oh, now they're playing real, real competition. That's why they lost to Baltimore. I was like, no, they're, they're falling apart already. Like the, the team is physically falling apart and I don't, I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, <laughs> there's, I don't feel like there's a way they can really recover just from yeah. story. I mean, story was the big, big name they needed. Yeah, Pavetta's only not a huge loss because I think he's gonna only gonna be out for a couple starts, a whatever. As long, yeah. yeah, as long as it's not a long term thing. But if we lose that guy for the year, it's it, I'm 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 calling it in. It's over because that's that's our. I think that's our ace this year. He's I think he's a 200 strikeout guy. He showed it his last two starts. He's throwing significantly more slider sweeper, whatever he's calling it. And you're really seeing it since July 1st. He's in top five in a lot of American League ranks. So that would be a tough loss. I hope he's he's as healthy as they're leading on. Um, and then I guess we'll see what we're going to get a short from Pablo Reyes or Sadon Rafaela or, I mean, they got Romy Gonzalez out there right now. I know nothing about him, but. It's too early to call up Marcelo Meyer. They're kind of in just a weird period right now. That we've kind of been stuck in since Xander Bogarts left. Yeah, there some Red Sox fans are calling for Meyer to come up, which is crazy. Like he's still so young. Uh, I don't. I don't think a lot of fans really understand the the development cycle. Um, you're not going to sacrifice his development for a like I don't know a fifty fifty shot. You make the wild card. At this point, like, why would you? Why would you do that? I don't. I don't get it. Um, I've seen some people calling to trade for Willie Adamas, which I'll admit I would love. Willie Adamas is a great glove and and can swing it, but I just don't see a world where the Brewers are giving up on on their season and trading Willie Adamas this early, unless we give up an absolute haul for him. Which for Willie Adamas, I don't think I'd do. For a frontline starter, yeah. Yeah, I think if you're if you're in like a playoff position in August or in July, like you're trying, you're gonna make a push, then go out and get somebody. Go out and get a Willie Adamas because, I mean, I, I don't I don't know if Milwaukee's really gonna be competing this year. I know some people are uh, higher on him than others. Um, I'm not super high on him, uh, but yeah, definitely not now. Like, don't, don't he's don't solid. Don't he's better than for, what we have. Yeah, he is, but don't mortgage your future no. for a 50-50 shot at a wild card spot. Um, the Yankees are 10-2, and two, best record in, ba- in the American League, actually in baseball. What, how, how often are we going to be doing this with the Yankees, where <laughs> every year, are we going to do it every year? The thing that scares me right now about the Yankees, though, is they're 10-2 and two and they haven't gotten much production out of Judge. They've gotten minimal out of Rizzo. LeMay Hughes going to come back, and then eventually Jason Dominguez at some point is coming back this year. So the, they're, the fact that they're doing this with on the backs of Volpe and Soto only, and, I mean, their pitching's been good too, but, I mean, Radon looks great, and Stroman looks great, but I, as a Red Sox fan, I hope they can't keep it up, but it's only a matter of time before Judge starts just going on a tirade across the game again, like he has the last couple of years when he's healthy. So, I don't like it, but I mean, you never know with their with their pitching. Rodon's been inconsistent. Stroman fell off after the All Star break last year, and they still don't know what's happening with Garrett Cole. So I, I'm not putting my chips in on the Yankees winning the American League yet, but it's, it's, they they look a lot better than I thought. Yeah, um, Baltimore. They so I I would assume you would just equate their kind of slow start to a just a slow start because they already kind of put their foot down a little bit yesterday, I guess Uh, we're up one, nothing on them. So, you know, clearly it's clearly, clearly the Red Sox are back already. We're up one, nothing, but um, Tyler O'Neill, baby. Are are they going to find their footing? Tyler O'Neill. Yeah. I mean, the Orioles are what six and four. They ran into a red hot pirates team earlier this week. And I don't remember who they had before that, but I, we we'll see what we get out of Jackson Holiday. We'll see what we get out of these these second year guys, Westberg, Henderson, uh, Cowser. They, I mean, they look good swinging it yesterday, but I, I I think they'll they'll 
be just fine, uh, barring any pitching injury, because God forbid and all of these pitchers going down, you never know what's going to happen. Um, but I think once they get Bradish back and their younger guys start getting more more and more experience, it's I think I think they'll be just fine. Yeah, as as a former collegiate pitcher, um, is it the pitch clock? What do you do? You think it's the pitch clock because Justin Verlander doesn't seem to think so. I think it's a combination of a lot of different things. The whole the whole big deal nowadays for pitchers is velocity, spin rate. The guys are throwing the ball and gripping the ball as hard as they can to get that spin and get that velocity. And it's when you have the when you equate that. Along with the pitch clock, it really doesn't help because you're. It's it's like you're you're training hard in the gym, max effort, and you cut down on your on your recovery time, mm-hmm. and uh, that leads to your muscles getting fatigued and possibly getting hurt. That's personal. I think it is. I know a lot of guys uh, on the national media have shared similar opinions. But yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at on that. I think it's it's kind of a combination of everything that's that's been changed in in the game with pitching. So what do you? I mean, what what would be your solution here? Do you tell them tough shit? You're gonna have to change how you're pitching, or is it you change the ball? Like what what's or do you cut down on the regular season games? I think it kind of starts from the bottom of the development chain for, uh, from whether it be youth. Youth arms or 13, 14 U, these guys, oh, they're seeing, oh, everyone's throwing hard. You got to, to make your high school team, you got to throw hard. To make, to go into college, you got to throw hard. To get drafted, you got to throw hard. It, it starts from the bottom. Those guys are, 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 they want to grow up throwing hard. So that's what they're going to do. And it's just become a culture in baseball. It is rotational strength as, as hard as you possibly can, swinging that hard going for exit velocities, going for throwing velocities. And it's just, uh, that's how it naturally is going to be. Guys are going to break down faster than, than guys in the early nineties throwing 88, 90. It's, it's just a completely different game. And when you add the pitch clock aspect to it, it, it really kind of speeds things up, I think. And I, I like the pitch clock. I don't like the extra, I think two seconds they, or they took off. To shave some time, so it, it's I've, it's got to be a lot of things. It's just not good for the game, though. Um, give me uh give me a couple of, of winners this week, I guess, around baseball. Um, I'm gonna go the Pirates. I think the Pirates have got this hot start going. They started twenty and eight at the, be- uh, at the beginning of last year, and then just kind of fell off. Nobody and uh, nobody really thought anything of it as the Pirates, but I think they're for real this year. I think Mitch Keller is going to emerge as an ace. I think Jared Jones is going to have a great rookie year. He's throwing gas 101-102, I think. Um, they finally got O'Neill Cruz fully healthy. They've got Key Brian Hayes fully healthy. Brian Reynolds is going to come around. He's always been reliable for them. Henry Davis gets another year under his belt. He's a 1-1 pick. I, th- I think they've got a lot of young talent. I think they're for real this year. And they took two out of three from the Orioles. So you saw that they've got the talent. They can beat the good teams. They lost their last couple just because, you know, David Bednar is struggling. He's having some, some issues closing games out. He's three blown saves so far this year. So I think they're going to keep this hot start going. And I think they're going to make a run at the central. I don't know if they'll eventually win it, but that would be a lot of fun to watch them go head to head with your young talent, with the Reds young talent and with the Cubs obviously being up there. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. What's, what's another winner you got? Maybe in the American League, I guess. American League, I kind of want to go the Angels. Just because I know they dropped two or three of the Red Sox, uh, but before that they were they were swinging it well, and, and they've got Mike Trout back. Like, they've got him back. He's fully healthy, knock on wood. He's tied for the American – or tied for the Major League lead in home runs with Tyler O'Neill. And he, I mean, finally hit a home run with somebody on base yesterday. Very selfish, right? Super I know, selfish. I, it, he, only hits home he, runs. he just likes to drive himself in, you know. But mm-hmm. it's it's so nice to see Mike Trout fully healthy and seeing the Angels. They lost Shohei, but they're not. They don't look horrible this early. I don't know if they'll they'll sustain a winning record for the rest of the year, but 
if if they keep Mike Trout healthy and get some good pitching out of some guys that they may not expect, Griffin Canning, uh, Reed Detmers, Patrick Sandoval could, could could be solid for them. But it would be a lot of fun to see see them at least compete for a few months this season. Yeah, I'm, before I'm, the Astros and Rangers run away with. Well, the Astros are in the cellar right now. Wor- worse than Oakland, which is odd to look at. It's it's a throwback to me, really. They it's started a, bad last throwback. year too, though. I'm not too worried. Oh yeah, no. They if they get in, as long as they get in, I think they'll be fine. As long as they can get into the playoffs, they'll be perfectly fine. They'll um, be back in the ALCS. Last week, I requested that the Mets win a game. That's what I was watching for. The Mets have won a game. They have won four, actually. Um, believe it or not, their combined team ERA is in the top 10 in Major League Baseball. Um, they just really can't hit the ball, which is hilarious. They just have no ability to hit the baseball. Yeah, they've, Jesus, they've had three postponed games already. That's insane. Four. Yeah, I think their postponed. first two games. Yeah, their first two games or two of their first, like, three games were postponed early. Yeah. That's just crazy. But, uh, you know, I just love, I, I absolutely love watching Frank the Tank just collapse on, on social media. Um, Frank was also in the, uh, what's it called, uh, the Barstool Open today, their mini golf tournament. Yeah, I saw him chewing on his putter. It was hilarious. He uh, he start, He had a bad start. I, I think it was a bad start. He could not get, he could just not get the ball past a certain point on a hole. It was hilarious. Um, he was freaking out. He goes, now I'm going to have a, now I'm going to make a six. Ah, he was just losing his mind. Um, I, I don't know. I think he would be a perfect caddy for someone like Tiger Woods who just wants like, dist- you know, or Tiger Woods' dad would like jiggle his keys in the background and stuff to teach Tiger to not be distracted. Frank the Tank training someone, some kid just having freakouts about the Mets in his backswing. That would be perfect. That would be absolutely perfect. Um, but yeah, the Mets are he's he's actually been shockingly somewhat positive about them, which I just I get the temperature of the Mets based on Frank. That's really how I do it. Although even when they're really good, he's still super negative, but he's always right. He is. <laughs> Frank's always right. <laughs> yeah, I I haven't tuned into his stuff a little uh, as much lately, but I, I know the Mets aren't doing too hot. But at least they're not the Marlins. That's true. Um, the Marlins can't. Well, they have one win, so they can figure out how to win one game. Um, I'm gonna give my second winner. I mean, the guard. Obviously, the Guardians are eight and three, which is a nice little surprise. But I'm I'm actually gonna give it to the Oakland Athletics because they're four and seven, and I thought they would have won two games at this point. So they've won double the amount of games that I expected. So congratulations to the Oakland athletics on not being in the cellar at the end of two weeks. You know, we're, we're close to two weeks uh, into the major league baseball season. Um, What about two losers, two losers? Uh, I just mentioned them, the Miami Marlins. Yeah. Uh, It it feels like too safe of a pick, but I'm kind of going to go into this with, they their pitchers got hurt and now they have absolutely no idea what to do. I I, I couldn't name you another guy in the rotation besides Lazardo and AJ Puck. Uh, I wanted to touch on AJ Puck because I watched him at Florida. He was a lot of fun to watch. He was a Friday guy. There was a starter, um, and now the Marlins. He was their closer last year, and they're about to uh, transition him into a starter. They've already started doing that. And his whole thing is deception. He's a he's a low arm slot guy, throws mid upper nineties, and now they're trying him more over the top. They've adjusted his arm slot to more more not quite over the top, but he's he's like a he's like a three forty delivery. He's the ERA covering it's horrible his stuff, not as deceptive his stuff, not as electric, and and it just it looks bad. Luzardo's a great pitcher, but he's all they've got. They had Kim Ng in their front office last year. Let her walk. And I think she was a big reason for their development, for the for the guys that they brought in, and a big reason why they made the playoffs last year when nobody ever thought they would. Yeah. And now everything's just kind of gone downhill with the injuries. Sandy's out for most of this year, if not the whole year. Yuri Perez is out for the year. Braxton Garrett's hurt right now, and I don't know the timetable on him, but their pitching is just horrendous. And 
you know, you got Jazz Chisholm dancing in the dugout when they're one and eleven <laughs> after he just went on a podcast crying about Miguel Rojas trying to trying to keep people accountable. Uh, they're one and eleven. He's dancing. Where's the accountability? And now everyone's afraid to step up because they're gonna know. Oh, my teammate's gonna go cry on a podcast about it. You saw the video of Josh Bell standing there watching him dance, and on, on some dude's podcast. So the Marlins are just falling apart right now in the worst sense of of the term. Mm-hmm. So, uh, they're they're my number one loser, and I I don't see them becoming a winner anytime soon. Yeah, that's perfect. I don't understand like that. That needs to be studied. the The fall of the Marlins because, like, then they kind of come into this year as as a somewhat of a dark horse to pick up a wild card spot. Like, it felt like there was maybe a small shot, and they are just horrendous. I mean, I've they they're so bad. <laughs> There's not much else you can say that that they're just bad. <laughs> I mean, their big right handed power guy was Jorge Soler. They lost him. They lost, of course. And now you can't name too many guys in their lineup as if you're a casual fan or if you only really pay attention to the American League. It's yeah. like some people have them finishing maybe third, maybe fourth uh, ahead of the maybe fight for a wild card spot if everything goes right for them. Uh, but <laughs> it's early, but there's there's nothing positive coming to Miami. What about a big loser in the American League? Uh, Tampa Bay Rays. I didn't get to talk about them much in my last preview, mostly or in our uh, season preview, mostly because you you don't know anyone on on the team. They lost three of their biggest superstars. Uh, they traded Glass out of the Dodgers. McClanahan's out for I think he's out for the, the entire season, and then um, their shortstop that they lost for reasons that we may not be able to speak on. <laughs> He was supposed to be a big deal for 10 years, and they've got Ryan Pepio. I, I, and Jeffrey Springs is coming back at some point this year, and it's just like openers. It's, they're they're not an exciting team. You always love to watch the Rays pitching factory go to work, random guys coming out throwing sidearm at 98 for whatever reason, mm-hmm. but you just, you're not seeing that this year. I think there are four and seven, four and eight. They're under 500. I know that. Seven they're and, they're seven and six right now. Okay, so they took the last three from the Rockies or whatever. I saw they lost the first game. But even then, the, 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 there's not a lot of excitement coming out of there. Uh, Randy Rosarena is the most overrated player of baseball right now. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. And outside of him, they they don't have a lot. Caballero went deep today. He looks good. He's probably going to torment the at least for years to come, but he's still young, so you don't know how much of the load he can, he can carry for them. And I, I just overall don't like the Rays as a person. As a fan, uh, I've never liked the Rays, and I, I try not to be too biased. Uh, but I'm I'm really down on them right now. I don't think they're they're going to be a whole whole scary uh, scary pitching staff that could that could steal some games in the East like they used to. So maybe I'm wrong. I usually am on this because I say this about the Rays every year. But it really feels like this is the first year that they kind of may not have it. They, we talked about this on uh, the last episode, we did our baseball draft. They try to claim everyone that walks through the door as, as like a, a ray for life. They try to claim Wade Boggs as a ray for life. Like I would be, I mean, obviously as a Red Sox fan, he is a Red Sox, but if the Yankees claimed Wade Boggs, I would say, okay, like I get it. He played there like, I think he played there like seven or eight years. So that's not like a short amount of time. He played like two years in Tampa. They they try to claim um, Don Zimmer as, as as like a ray for life as a coach. Like you, know, if you walk into Tropicana Field, they have like shrines to all these players that were there at the end of their career that literally did nothing, that accomplished basically nothing because the Rays haven't accomplished anything of note in in their history. They won the American League a couple times. Congratulations! You can't win a title. Yeah, um, they have shrines for all their wild card appearances and and ALDS appearances. It's it's so sad when you walk into the trap. Yeah, and I, I I'm a hater Red Sox fan, but I think a lot of people probably agree on on that. As a Colts fan, the most embarrassing thing to ever happen to us was the AFC finalist banner. Like that's so embarrassing, and nobody even talks about because the Rays. It's just like well known. It's like okay, they just suck, so they get to do that. 
Like if you if nobody talks about your banners about winning a wild card game, like that's not what you hang banners for. Those are just not banners. You don't do banners for that. The the Diamondbacks getting rings for the National League for the NLCS, which I know that's commonplace, but to me that's still a little odd. It's like you you got rings for runner up. Congrats. Like they did a ring National ceremony. League. They're 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 having a ceremony for winning the National League, not finishing second in their division and making the playoffs. Which yeah, I, I mean, mean they like, they technically it, did do as well, but or they finished third in their division, but they've actually won something in the playoffs. I just think it's weird to do rings rings for second place. Like no matter what. Like you won the National League, but you you didn't win the World Series. Rings are only for titles in my opinion. Like actual World Series titles. Maybe do like a do like a medallion, you know, do like a second, second place medallion, get like a silver medal, you know, that, that whole thing, you get to hang it up, you get to wear it around or or maybe a watch. I think a watch, actually a watch would be pretty sick. Like do like a, na- like a national league championship watch. Plus watch is more, I think a watch is more functional anyways than a big ring. Yeah, that's, that's fair. But also, I mean, you gotta, you gotta think of the perspective It's the Diamondbacks. They've been a, a team for, 25 26 years now that's true and like if we saw this out of a team if we saw some of the red sox the yankees the ding rings for losing in the world series we'd probably be a lot more critical i would at least uh but it's it's nice to see what the diamondbacks did last year when they weren't expected to so i i don't mind the rings i won't i won't give them shit for it i'm good with a banner banner's good if you win the national league that's a, a banner's good i would like a watch i think the watch the watch just makes more sense because the World Series winner also gets a ring, which like I don't I feel like you also just shouldn't be doing the same celebratory thing as the World Series winner. You got to do something, something different, maybe a bracelet. So I don't know, something like that. Um, did we do? Lo- oh, yeah, we already did loser for you. Um, I guess my loser in the National League would be. I don't even know. I mean, I'm going to go with the Phillies because their City Connect uniforms are just horrible. They're so bad. They they probably won't even get them anyways for like two months, but they're so horrible. I just, what, what, I mean, first off, the thing that drives me crazy is the city of Philadelphia, their, their flag colors are that uniform, but they don't have a team with those colors, with the main flag colors, like as their, as their specific colors. Like, I feel like the 76ers maybe should, should follow that a little more. Um, but like the city connect uniforms, it looks like they're trying to do like monster mash with them, you know, like a monster mash theme. And it's just not, yeah. it doesn't fit. Yeah. I, I don't hate the color scheme or the design, but it's the font that really gets yeah. me. It looks like they're trying way too hard to look like modern. I think it could be a really cool jersey. I don't know what the pants look like with it. I'm, I'm a big, big advocate for the pants in city connect jerseys, at least matching the jersey i like uh like that with their jersey and uh, the dodgers all blue um so but it's like a gradient kind of thing so you know how like it's like light blue at the top and then it kind of goes yeah. down into dark blue and then what's odd is they have a light blue belt that breaks up the shirt from the pants and then it goes into the same color blue at like the bottom of the jersey in the pants and like there's like a white shirt it doesn't fit the color does not match whatsoever this thing is horrible they did this is disgusting the more i look at it the more i hate it i don't hate it just because i like weird uniforms so i might i might just be a little weird like that i I love i love (laughs) stupid uniforms sometimes but the 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 font is what gets me the red sox uniform like let's Obviously, the Boston Marathon. But besides the Boston Marathon, like, besides that connection, that's stupid. I'm going to say it. See, I love it. I love, I love it I love because the it's the Boston design. Marathon. But if you, like, took context out of it and someone was just like, oh, these are the City Connect uniforms and they didn't know about the Boston Marathon, they'd be like, this is this is ridiculous. This is, this is like, no colors match. Do we wear yellow pants with that? No, they were they were white pants, but yeah, they have to do the yellow. Oh, yellow, yellow pants would be hideous, though. No, yellow. Well, that's like kind of what you got to do. You got to like match it. I think the yellow pants with a blue stripe down the side, that would look good. I think that would. I think it would fit perfectly. And 
again, as a Bostonian or as a, as a Red Sox fan, and I understand all the history, it completely makes sense. And I love them. And we win whenever we wear them as well. Um, I mean, you had, you have to keep wearing them like 2021 when they debuted them. It's 21, right? I think so. Yeah. Like, cause then they got hot at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was all, that was a great time. So I'll always have good memories. Like the Colt, when the Colts wore their alternate, the mid, the Indiana Knights uniforms, I just have nightmares because we lost the game in like horrendous fashion. But yeah, Philly is my, is my loser of the week just because of those uniforms. It's going to be my winner this week. No, don't you need an American League loser? Or, or loser, sorry. My, I'm, okay. I don't know why I did that. Um, I'm going to go, I mean, I have to, I feel like the Red Sox are a loser. They, they lost so much this week. Even if it is like small with Pavetta, you lose Pavetta. But like all these guys, um, who did we have that just had Tommy John today? Uh, Chris Martin. Chris Murphy. Or Murphy, Murphy. Not Chris Murphy. Martin. Martin's still healthy, don't worry. But yeah. Murphy Murphy uh, was pretty good at the end of last, or uh, when he was up in some sense. Chris sprints. Murphy, I mean, he goes into, to- he has Tommy John too. Like, losing a lot of guys. Oh, there you go. Um, I guess you could, I mean, you could also say like the Chicago White Sox. And and they're trying, and uh, Jerry Reinsdorf is trying to move him out of Chicago as well. They're trying to get him to Nashville. Um, you know, that's the one I'm not against. Because the White Sox, in my opinion, have always felt like the other team in Chicago. Like, they just don't have, because the, it's the Cubs. You have Wrigley Field. Like, what's, what? the only thing I can think of that's notable about the White Sox is the Black Sox scandal. Yeah, outside of the 05 team, they haven't done anything in the 21st century. Yeah. And it looks like they're kind of just, they have no interest in, in doing anything for that team. And now Rob, Luis Robert, Robert, whatever, however you pronounce it, he's hurt. Mankata got yeah, hurt, too. Mankata's out probably, they said, maybe for the year. Eloy, I, I, he's always hurt. I don't, I don't even know what his status is right now, but he's, I mean, he's, if they, if he can stay on the field, he's going to be their only, I guess, productive hitter than, yeah. that I can think of right now. Ben Intendi, if he somehow, but I, yeah, the White Sox are a very, very clear loser. Yeah, yeah. Both I mean, Sox teams. It's either it's red or white. The Sox. If if you wear socks, if you are socks, then you're probably a loser this week. Um, they're also two and nine. I mean that whatever that all in thing that they did like three four years ago. I feel like that's like the the most disingenuous all in they've ever done. Like any team has ever done. Just it utterly it was an utter 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 failure, and it didn't even really feel like they were like all chips are in, even though they said they were. No, they signed their biggest free agent deal in, in franchise history, and it's yeah, Monte Grandal at like four years, seventy million. Yeah, <laughs> and then Benintendi, I think, like matched it, right? Like he was like, or maybe he, he was around it. I think he was five years, seventy five million. He might have gotten more total, less a. I think I think that I think he set the to yeah he set the total record so it was like I mean Andrew Ben like I love Ben Intendi I still have a, a a jersey of him that I wear like pretty regularly but he's not he's not worth setting your your team record in free agent signing so that's one I don't mind like the the Athletics I hate to see them move they're such a historic team too and like they have done some some stuff of note in the 21st century like you would just say like the ownership clearly just does not care to win like they historically they have not cared to win it's john fisher who should sell like the white Sox. like they won that title in 2005 but like i think that's also a forgotten title because 2004 was the the year before that's like one of the most memorable titles i think in sports history so, like, when you're following it up, it's like following up Bill Belichick. It's like, well, you're never going to win. Like, you will never, you'll never be remembered because you followed up the greatest of all time. So, yeah, yeah just horrible. I, and, and, the, and the Astros were in the National League, too, which is weird. That's just like a weird World Series matchup. Yeah, I remember that with the, with the darker types. The, the National League Astros were fun, but they also were terrible. I like I like the the old uniforms. That reminds me of the two thousands. Makes it makes me think of Lance Berkman and Hunter Pence and Michael Bourne. Yeah, Roy as well. I don't really I really do not like the new ones. I don't know why. I think it's just my my like bias towards 
early 2000s or like 2000s designs and stuff but i just don't i mean and they could also just go way way back go back to the like the 70s those those unis are sick some of the best in sports i think oh yeah the nolan ryan era the, with the stripes along the the front of the stomach just great jersey yeah and people people when you talk also i guess when you talk about the the uh tommy john issue um old people are just going crazy about it they're like oh nolan ryan didn't didn't need tommy john he was fine he pitched till he was 40 i was like it's like okay one guy one guy you want to point to <laughs> come on the other guys are like they're throwing slop drop in <laughs> into the into the catcher like there, there's nothing else uh, you point out one guy who didn't need tommy john like i can point out one guy who didn't need tommy john you know and in this era he just shocked and the whole had tommy john a bit a big deal that a couple of the pitchers i've seen have come out and said are these guys are getting hurt throwing as hard as they can when their body's not built to throw as hard as they can yeah. nolan ryan was just a country strong dude who was built to throw as hard as uh, he was he throwing as he could he was probably touching 98 with these with probably 104 in his back pocket for all we knew and then we saw yeah or we didn't see because we were not alive yet but in, in his last start in 94 he wasn't built to throw hard he was 44 45 years old he completely wasn't he wasn't built to be so that, that's kind of it kind of goes along with what you see but I mean, yeah, sure, no, didn't need Tommy John in his career, but he, he was he was a guy that was throwing hard when he was supposed to. He was he wasn't overexerting his body until he was, he was old. 46, 46, 46 when he retired. And then it was ninety four was his last season or ninety three. Uh, whoops! Damn, I want to hit the nail on that one. Nineteen ninety three. Yeah, and then Pitch we'll touch better. on one more thing, and then we will get out of here. Uh. A lot of people, because I, I wanted to do this at the back end of the show. A lot of people were like, hey, where's Kurt Schilling? Where's Kurt Schilling at the Red Sox uh, honoring the 2004 team? Um, and then some people were like, oh, the Red Sox are too, I don't know. They, I'm quoting when I say Red Sox are too woke because they don't like his beliefs. No, that's not what it was. Uh, a lot of people are misinformed. Kurt Schilling leaked Tim and Stacy Wakefield's cancer diagnosis, even though they asked, hey, don't say anything on your podcast. Um, so Kurt Schilling, throw out all the other stuff that he said, you know, throw out like any other political opinions he's had. Cause you know, people agree and disagree. Just a scumbag, just a, just a whore, just a bad person for saying that he said he did it in the name of God or Jesus. He said something like that. And I was like, you know, if Jesus was, was here right now, he would probably say, Hey, don't say anything. <laughs> just do what your friend asked, your dying friend asked, and don't say anything. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I'm I'm not the kind of guy that'll cancel somebody or, or or call them a piece of shit on their on whatever they believe on something outside of baseball. But you you had your teammate Tim Wakefield for years. You you guys won won a championship together, and I'd like to think they were close friends up until that. I mean, point. that's what Wake, that's what Schilling said in the video. He was like my close friend Tim Wakefield. So of course, yeah. I mean, I so I, I I give people the benefit of the doubt and, until they give me reason not to. And Jesus, man, it's that's fucked up. That Kurt Schilling, it was a good thing he wasn't there. I saw the quote uh, Chris Cattell put out or Sean McAdam put out. Um, the Derek Lowe said uh, somebody was going to say something. It would have been a distraction. Somebody would have. Uh, he alluded to somebody was going to smack the shit out of him. Probably wouldn't actually have happened, but. You, especially at a, at a ceremony honoring Tim Wakefield, it's, unless Schilling completely, yeah, it, unless Schilling completely came out and and retracted everything, apologized. Even then, probably not, dude. It's something, something that Which, I, I I hate to see because I, I it was fun to watch Kurt Schilling pitch. Tristan Casas just went over the monster five nothing. Hell yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah, fuck Kurt Schilling for that. I I, I loved watching Kurt Schilling pitch. And I, I mean, I was two years old living in Arizona when the Diamondbacks won in 2001. Like, I grew up knowing who Kurt Schilling was and then how great he was as a pitcher. You did Tim Wakefield dirty. You did Stacey Wakefield dirty. And I don't think Red Sox Nation will ever forgive him for it. 
I can't remember who said this, but he probably will never be able to show his face at Fenway again. Schilling said, um, this is not a message that Tim has asked anyone to share. That's where you stop. He, he even Doesn't said, matter. I shouldn't say this. He said he felt he needed to disclose it anyway because, quote, as a Christian and a man of faith, I have seen prayer work. Um, I really don't give a shit <laughs> what 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 you say um, as a man of faith. I respect that you have a belief, but this is absolutely insanity. Like, that's literally as soon as you say, hey, Tim said, don't share it. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter. There is no there's no reason whatsoever. Um, also, Wade Boggs said something. Hold on. Well, I apologize yeah, I for that. spreading Tim Wakefield cancer news after Kurt Schilling revealed ex-teammates diagnosis. Um, what did Wade Boggs say? Oh, okay. Wade Boggs. Oh, did he like repost what Schilling said or something? I think he did. And he said, at the time I posted my tweet, I was unaware that Tim's condition was not supposed to be public. My apologies to Tim and his family. Um, I'm going to chalk that up. I'm going to give Wade Boggs the benefit of the doubt that he's just older and did not. I don't know. He was just older and you had, he had an older man moment. Like he just was. He probably saw a headline and didn't listen to the whole clip, but that yeah. would be my guess. I don't think Wade Boggs would be the kind of guy to spread some shit like that knowingly. Yeah. Um, it said Schilling did apologize for the handling. Don't I, I just don't care. Like it, is, apolog- it, it wasn't public enough because I didn't really I didn't know anything about it. And like imagine you go back to like two thousand five and said, hey, like, Kurt Schilling is going to be absolutely despised by Red Sox Nation at the 20-year end. Like, he won't even be there. And none of the team will want him there. Everyone will be like, what What the fuck? That would be like Jake Arrieta, I feel like, not being welcomed to the, like, 2026 celebration of the 26th. It's like Madison Bumgarner not being invited back to any of the Giants. Why? Like, yeah. You would never you would never believe it in a million years just because of how big a part they were on the field. But it happens off the field. Yeah. Just don't be an asshole. Listen, like, that's the one thing some podcasters do not know is to just keep your mouth shut. Just shut your mouth. Like, I know you're on a talk show, on a radio show, but you got to have some sort of sense of, hey, this guy going through a really tough time, brain cancer fucking sucks. And then it was even worse that, you know, he he passed, like, not too long after I think that happened. So it was like a couple weeks, maybe a month. Could have been like, hey, did the stress do it? Like, obviously, we don't know what stage it was in or whatsoever. But still, like, that's, man, really, really bad. Um, But if you were wondering why he wasn't there, that was why. I don't think it had to do with, because I think he was there in 2014 when they did it. And I think he had already had a few things before that. Like, he pissed off the entire state of Rhode Island. Yeah. (laughs) With his, I forget what it was. He was like the mayor or the, or the governor of Rhode Island, and then the, the Rhode Island government law must have been story. I was too young. But... Oh, it was the video game. Video game. Do you remember that? No. So he had, he he was had like a, a political game figure company. out there. He had a video game company. It was um, I remember this. They they were trying to do like it was like Kurt Schilling baseball. Or something like that. I can't remember what it... I can't remember, like, all the details behind it. Yeah. Sa- Kurt Schilling Center at an animation team meeting at 38 Studios. Hold on. Was Kurt Schilling 38? I can't remember. Yeah. Number 38. Yeah, here it is. Uh, American Video Game Development co- Studio and Publisher in Providence. Uh, in 2006, as Green Monster Games by Kurt Schilling. He wanted to create an original fantasy property collaborating with... Todd McFarland and another one, another guy. Uh, m- multiplayer online role playing game known as Project Copernicus. Jesus, I, I, yeah, I, I read something that he lost a lot of money for people in Rhode Island. I thought he was a political thing, but I that's no. I that's think I think, I think he lost. A, I think it did have to do with politics as well, but I think he did lose a lot. He had a depths over one hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, handling of the Rhode Island loan prompted several legal cases, though none led to prosecutions. Yeah, he... Yeah, not, a, not a great post-playing career for, for old Kurt. Here it is. 38 Studios relocated to Providence in exchange for a $75 million loan from the local government. So 
Uh, I think he just lost them $78 million, which is absolutely. crazy. Um, Cause I remember when he was on ESPN, he was on, uh, what was it? Baseball tonight with, he was on one of those shows. Let me see. Uh, remember baseball tonight when it was at like its peak. I, I love that baseball tonight. Carl Ravitch. That was elite stuff. Just the music, the, the, like just the bit, I can already hear the ESPN music. Cause I had a, I had an alarm clock that was shaped like a baseball as a kid. My grandfather bought it for me and it was ESPN branded and it would play the ESPN, like MLB on ESPN theme song when it would go off. And that was the one alarm sound that I never hated. I always loved hearing it. I can't find anything. All right. Well, anyways, um, we're going to wrap up there. Uh, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, uh, share all those things. Um, and we will see you on Monday.